Hello, beautiful people. This is a special edition of Communal Table. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, and this is part of Food & Wine Pro. So today is Bourdain Day, as deemed by uh, Jose Andres and Eric Repair, two very close friends of Anthony Bourdain, who wanted to use this day, um, Anthony Bourdain's birthday, for people to share memories of of all kinds of, of this man who really had an outsized impact on the world. And I think that is such a beautiful and wonderful thing to do. I can also say I'm, I'm not quite there yet. Um, it's complicated uh, because I do think we should remember Anthony Bourdain for everything he did for, for food, for the world, for making the world bigger and smaller, uh, talking to people of all different cultures, creeds, races, everything um, over, over food and showing people that we we have more in common than we thought. Um, he, he was somebody I knew and somebody I cared about and his loss was um, by suicide was very sudden and shocking. And uh, as I was expressing to a friend recently, um, you know, the reason I feel a little bit conflicted about this is I do want to celebrate his memory and all the great things about him and the lives he's touched. But at the same time, his life for me right now is inextricable um, from his his death and and how he died. So uh, we're gonna, I was at the Welcome Conference recently here in New York City, a fantastic um, one day symposium for people in the hospitality industry and got a chance to sit down with some really incredible people and talk with them about uh, various things and ask them uh, if they had any memories of Anthony Bourdain that they wanted to share. And I was really heartened to see that a lot of them really, uh, some of them knew him very well, some of them uh, knew him not at all, but definitely felt his impact on the culinary world. So I asked them to share some of their feelings, um, and we also have a little bit of a conversation with uh, Laurie Wollever, who had been his uh, assistant for nine years and his collaborator and his conciliary. How do you say that? <laughs> uh, but very uh, close with him and working on projects together with him and who is finishing up some books that they're co-writing together. So just wanted to note that some of this might be a little bit difficult, emotional to listen to. In the end, I think, you know, some pretty positive uh, things come out of it. But just in case, I wanted to share a, a few um Numbers and resources with you. Crisis text line is 741-741. Text them anytime, day or night, and there is somebody there to listen to you and to help you get from a hot moment to a cool calm. Um, there is also Ben's Friends. I uh, actually spoke with Steve Palmer, one of the founders of it. That is a recovery uh, resource for people in the industry. The Giving Kitchen is an incredible organization that is offering uh, free resources for people who want to do uh, suicide intervention and prevention and you can find them online um, as well by looking up the giving kitchen we'll have everything in the notes but here I'm gonna turn this over to uh, some people who ha- have some things to say um, I just want to say thank you Tony for everything you gave us and I miss you let's hear from Andrew Zimmern Steve Palmer Alpana Singh Anthony Rudolph Andrew Friedman, Brian Canlis, Drew Nipurantz, Hunter Lewis, Gary Obligacion, Patrick O'Connell, Amy Mills, and Laurie Wollever. Andrew Zimmern, uh, author, entrepreneur, chef, TV host guy. Oh, wow. My favorite, Tony. Uh, I'm... I'm pretty sure that I've shared this before, but it is it is my favorite Tony, so I can't I can't share it enough times. So uh, I joined Travel Channel 13, 14 years ago. I'm doing specials and so they're testing me for the show. Uh, Bizarre Foods is 12 and three quarters years. In February, it'll be 13 years. Wow. So Tony has just joined. He's just come over from Food Network with Cook's Tour. The Travel Channel aired for a year prior to him starting No Reservations. So uh, he's there with an established show. So they're not testing him, right? He's actually working. But we're both at the network. And I, I did two specials, World's Best Ballpark Foods and Bizarre Foods of Asia. As pilots, they wanted to see which one was going to be better. 
So we meet and, you know, uh, we're playing New York City geography. And it's like, you know, uh, friends of mine, parents knew his mom. We both went to Vassar. We were both recovering heroin addicts. We were, you know, both cooks in New York at the same time. We had been in the same places and some of the same parties, not necessarily great places to be at different times in our life. So we had a lot to talk about. And even back then, before he was Tony in the way he was to most of the public that did know him, he was still the most charismatic, symphonic human being I ever knew. I mean, he didn't, you know... He still, at, at that point, could talk endlessly about, you know, Polish cinema of the 50s or, you know, 1960s, you know, you know, pre-metal bands. And, I mean, you know, like whatever you wanted to talk about, he could converse about. And I just, I instantly wanted him to like me and wanted to be friends. And Flash, I had a year, season one, they wanted to do a crossover show with us. And we're shooting promos for it before we shot it. And we're on the uh, on the Brooklyn side of the river on that uh, wide sort of embarcadero that's there. And we're shooting this thing. And, you know, we walk out 100 paces and they're, they say, hey, when we give, when we wave, just walk towards us. Don't say anything. No mouth flapping. Just walk occasionally look at each other, look out to the right. We have a camera over there, you know, the typical kind of thing. They're going to capture a whole bunch of stuff with one walk um, to lay some track underneath. And they're having a camera issue or a mic issue or something like that on their end, and they're fixing it. So we turn to each other and we start talking. And I, I fear this is my mom just because, you know, what are we doing tonight? Let's go out, you know, because now I'm, you know, and this is 13, 14 years ago. I'm like, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be friends. This is going to be fantastic. And he looks at me and he says, he literally like he was reading my mind. He says, the only way we're going to be friends is if you have a successful first season. So don't fuck it up. <gasps> and I looked at him with that face. It was like, what do you mean? He says, they've tried every show before me, after me, et cetera. It's not working. This network has to work. I want this network. I mean, like with this all in Pat Young was the person who brought Tony over, he brought me over, then subsequently a lot of other, you know, to try to make a, a travel channel filled with immersive experts. Um, and the glory years of that network, I think, was when Pat was running it. I mean, it just had, was firing on all cylinders. But for Tony to say that and articulate that that way it was just the magic of him and the pressure was on, and I was like, you're darn right, I'm not going to fuck it up. And, you know, Monday was, for the first two or three years, was our night. It was my show followed by his show, and it just blew up Travel Channel. And then he, he kept Monday, and I moved to Tuesday, or vice versa. I forget what the, or vice versa, or whatever. And, and that's how the network, like, enlarged and planted flags. And then other people came up behind me and you're like, you know, don't fuck it up. You're on my night, right? I mean, don't fuck up my night. And, but over the years, as we realized how much more we had in common, we had wives we didn't see as much of as we wanted to or should have. We took our work more seriously probably than we should have in a selfish way. I mean, I acknowledge that. We, you, you get off. We loved what we did so much. We loved being on the road telling those stories so much that you can't help leaning into that. Sometimes to our dad, we both had kids that we didn't spend en enough time with. And as we be became friends, you know, his, his words were very pressing. They came true because we became close despite the fact that because we we're always on the road we didn't see as a lot of each other um and i probably talked to him in the last couple of years of his life way more than we ever had before he became very chatty uh all of a sudden he discovered texting dming 
I got the DMs. And and I was just like, you know, my, I, I actually said to him, like, are you, are you fucking all right? I mean, like, you know, just joking with him because he would just like text me shit out of the blue. He would be reading my Twitter feed. I would say something nice about some random person. He'd be like, oh, this is how I know the blah, 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 blah. Why do you think they're nice? And he'd want to have a conversation. Um, it was really funny. We would start to, you know, meet in various parts of the world or cities or whatever and, you know, have to and be checking in and talking about real shit more regularly. But I'll never forget that day on the on the Brooklyn side of the bridge right underneath it and... He also said another thing to me that day that I've never forgotten. He said, TV is a vile mistress. You signed a contract with them. You've already given away your integrity. Don't ever think you can have it back. (sighs) (laughs) That's very him. That's perfect. Brian Koppelman, co-creator, showrunner of Billions. I only met him once, briefly, and... um, I brought up uh, AJ Liebling, and he oh, was you just so, hit me where I live right there. He was so <laughs> happy that I brought <laughs> Liebling up, and I didn't. I I loved his work. I read all his books. Uh, we met actually. We met twice. We met once when he had um, written his first novel, uh, but we, I didn't know, really know who, at that time. I barely knew who he was, and then the second time we met was you know years later, and he was. Uh, becoming Anthony Bourdain he was already had one show on and I brought up Liebling to sort of say I I feel like you're chasing Liebling's ghost and he loved hearing that and I loved being able to connect with him in that way Um, but I didn't know him and feel free not to use my answer because most of these people here knew and loved him personally no I think that actually he had that unique ability to make people feel like he like they even if they had one experience they remember the hell out of it so yeah for sure Steve Palmer, managing partner of the Indigo Road Restaurant Group. So, so as a sober person and as a person in recovery, um, I think about sort of the first time I read Kitchen Confidential. And listen, um, in the recovery community, we all tell war stories, right? We all laugh. At, part of the healing process is being able to look back and laugh. So it's not that when I read sort of a glamorized version of drug and alcohol abuse that I'm offended but to read that, to see the way the public sort of glorified that behavior, put it up, and then to really watch his journey about sort of acknowledging that, getting sober. Um, and yet, uh, Ben's Friends was, co- was founded for Ben Murray, who committed suicide. None of us knew he was suffering. None of us knew he was depressed. So there was a lot of parallels. So for me, Bourdain Day is about our industry continuing to not allow people to suffer in silence. Could you explain for a sec what Ben's Friends is? Sure. So Ben's Friends is a weekly support group. Um, We're in in six cities going to 12 that meets um, for the industry that specifically addresses drugs and alcohol. Um, It's founded by people that are sober, trying to help people that want to get sober. Um, We are a resource, a bridge to other therapeutic outlets, and um, our primary purpose is to help restaurant people not only get sober, um, but also hopefully, and this is a secondary goal, realize that they can work in the industry and not do drugs and alcohol because there was a time not long ago that that, those two things, there was some absurdity in thinking you could not abuse drugs and alcohol and work in the business. So we are specifically trying to teach people that they have a choice. Alvin is saying, Master Sommelier, restaurateur and entrepreneur. You know, I do. I have a very, um, I've never met Anthony Bourdain and I'm sad that I never will. But I remember being in Japan when I learned of his passing. And a couple days prior, I had gone to the Lawson's, like a 7-Eleven in in Tokyo. And I remember Anthony Bourdain saying that if you're in Japan, you have to go to the Lawson's and eat this egg salad sandwich. So it was on my list of, you know, do what Bourdain, I do as Bourdain would do. And so I went, bought it. It was delicious, of course. And I remember taking a photo of it of like, oh, I'm Anthony Bourdain. And then, of course, two days later, I, I get a text of Anthony Bourdain passed away. And I'm like, what? And I just sat there and I was just devastated. And it's interesting how you can be so devastated to hear of the loss of a person that you never met. And and it was in that moment like, wow, this guy has meant so much to me. And then I realized he's the reason I'm in Japan. 
he's the reason I'm here. He's the reason that, you know, you watch his show and you see that fearlessness of just going to Syria and Turkey and, you know, just these like, even just parts of the United States that you would never think to, you know, go to. And I'm like, wow, he's the reason I'm here. He's the reason why I went to this convenience store, got an egg salad. I mean, he's the reason why so many of us have a passport, you know, and, and, it's a tremendous loss, but I think that to honor him is to just to keep going and to keep traveling. Anthony Rudolph, co-owner and founder of the Welcome Conference and co-create NYC. I remember what I thought the day I heard the news. That even the seemingly strongest of us um, can't find a path to vulnerability and that I believe our industry and the birth of our industry and thus the culture of our industry play a huge role in that. That vulnerability equals weakness and that couldn't be more than the truth. Vulnerability is strength Um, and certainly my heart broke for that day. because I know there were thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people that think and feel similarly alone and unable to speak and share, um, both because it's an incredibly difficult thing as a, as a person, but also because we don't champion it as peers and colleagues and leaders, and we need to. My name is Andrew Friedman. I'm the author of Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll and the host of the podcast, Andrew Talks to Chefs. Oh, geez. That's actually hard for me. Uh, You'll tell me if I'm going too fast. This is the last question. You can hit, I'm going to tear up as I say this. Um, all right. So I think this is the one. Uh, I did not know, I'm always quick to say this, especially because as we, you and I know, we were talking the other day, I've been in, I got interviewed in some prominent places about him, but I didn't know Tony that well, as with many people, more than I realized till he was gone. Um, he was nice to so many people. I don't know how he did it. You probably have this also, Kat. As I've gotten more known, I hear from a lot of people who want advice and, you know, and I, I try to give it to everybody. I can't even imagine what his inbox was like. But then when he died, all the, everybody seemingly that asked for five minutes of his time got it. I don't know what he had left for himself. So I, at the encouragement of a mutual friend, asked him if he would give me an interview. This must have been in 2000, maybe 14? For my blog. I had a blog. I still have it, but it's being neglected. And um, five minutes later, he sends me back an email. Absolutely. It's probably going to take a while to schedule, but I'm copying Lori Wolliver, who, as most people now know, was his aide de camp. And um, we made an appointment to talk. And uh, about a, earlier in the week of the week we were going to meet, I got. Um, I, can't, I honestly, this is so weird because I have such a great memory normally. I don't remember if it was an email or a phone call. I think it was an email. And I saw it was from Lori. And I thought, oh, here's the cancellation, you know. And Lori says to me, or writes to me, uh, Tony needs to watch the movie Chef, the John Favreau movie. Which in passing, I would say, is actually a movie about a middle-aged man's effort to master Twitter. But that's another story. <laughs> um uh, and you know, Tony was friendly with Roy Choi, who mm-hmm. had consulted on the thing. He needs to watch it. They're sending over a screening copy. He's going to watch it at zero point zero, which was the production company that did his shows. He thought you might like to join him. Okay, so this for me is like I don't know what you know, a tennis fan being asked to come watch a practice alone, you know, with like Andre Agassi or Roger Federer or whatever. And then you two can go do your interview over lunch. So I go over there. It was me, Tony, and Helen Cho who did the social Mm -hmm. media there. That was it. We watched this movie together. And I had made a a reservation for lunch at the Breslin, which was nearby. And uh, we walked over there. Uh, We sit down. It's like maybe one in the afternoon. I know he was going to China, I think it was, the next day for the show. So we sit down. And he says, um, 
I said, how much time do you have? And he looks at me and he goes, you're my last appointment of the day. And we interviewed for about two hours. We sat and gossiped for about an hour. Um, he gave me, so I had seen him in San Francisco, not him. Uh, I was, I was with Jeremiah Tower in San Francisco at Zuni Cafe and they were filming a sizzle reel or like a little sales reel for what became The Last Magnificent, which Tony was the executive producer of. And I asked him in the interview, did you, I, you know, I was in San Francisco and I was with Jeremiah and there was, a, they were filming a sizzle reel. Whatever happened with that? And he said, well, we're making this movie called The Last Magnificent. And it's going to go, I don't know if I have the title. We're making a movie about Jeremiah. It's going to make the festival circuit and then it's going to, uh, you know, be on CNN. And I said, oh, was that announced? No. I said, can I announce it? Sure. Just like that. Sure. And then we were talking a little more and he mentions, uh, we talked about Shep Gordon, who was like an agent, unofficial agent. He was a music figure. There was a movie about him called Supermensch. I said, I heard you were maybe doing something with Shep Gordon. And he said, yeah, you know, I saw that movie and I approached Shep and he's going to write a memoir for us. And I said, is that out there? No. And I said, I can mention that? Yep. And then he tells me, honestly, I don't know if he ever did this, that he was going to do a sequel to Get Jiro, the comic thing with a different artist, but the same collaborator, Joel Rose. And, uh, you know, once again, he's like, you can have that. So on my little blog that at the time probably had like 200 subscribers, I'm not even kidding. I had all this new, I ran an interview and, you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, there were like, you know, full, like, you know, 800 words write-ups on Eater, like quoting from my thing, you know, it was a, now, Everything about that interaction from inviting me to join him to watch the movie to giving me that much time to giving me that news, he knew full well, having been a struggling writer at one point, what all that meant for me. Personally, I think, definitely professionally, and what it would mean for my stock, you know. That's my Tony Bourdain memory. I mean, that to me was just, I still can't believe it as I'm telling this story, you know, because we weren't pals. You know, one, I'd ask him for, a, you know, once in a, once every year, maybe I'd write him a note and say that was great or thanks for the support. You know, he would tweet my stuff out. That was our relationship. I never had, except for that lunch, I never had a meal with Tony. I didn't go drinking with Tony. I didn't, I didn't have that relationship with him. I mean, I would have loved it. I think it's because I couldn't get past who he was, honestly. I, I know writers who spent time with him and I think it was my own insecurity. I think he probably would have done those things if I had asked, you know, but I just... I was too geeky around him. I, I couldn't handle it, I to be the, honest. I know the feeling. My name is Brian Ganless, and I identify professionally as a restaurateur. So I had the honor and total pleasure of being on No Reservations um, several years ago. And Anthony came to our restaurant and was interviewing us about our favorite things in the city. And at one point, I said something um, a little bit negative about another property in the city, how they had kind of sold out, and uh, they didn't have the soul that they used to. I, as an independent restaurant guy, I'm a little maybe biased towards the independent spots. And I instantly like stopped, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't on, like, in the media say something negative about... And Anthony like kind of put his arm around me. He's like, no, 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 like... The, your voice matters. Um, he's like, don't, don't follow the rules all the time. Um, like, say the thing that's on your heart. It's like, it's like, we're gonna do this again. And he's like, yes, like trash that place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wasn't trying to be negative about it, but he, he wanted to uh, make me care less about the rules and more about having a voice. Uh, and I like loved that. Um, I also love the fact that. Before you know it, he was running into the kitchen and giving the, all the cooks a hug. And he, he knew that he was a hero to those guys. Um, and he owned it. He was shaking people's hands. He, had, he came out with, the, with a, a comic book that year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so a, a couple of the guys had comic books, and he was, like, signing. He was, um, for being such a big deal and such an icon in our industry and a guy that paved the way for so much, um, he, was, he was a down-to-earth cook at heart and he was not one inch above any of the cooks in that kitchen uh, and came down to their level and talked face to face to us to everyone um, yeah sometimes you meet TV people 
and maybe they let you down a little bit. Um, gosh, he sure didn't. Drew Niporent from the restaurants Batard, Nobu, Tribeca Grill, and I own a little wine store called Crush on 57th Street. Yeah, um, I got a phone call from him very early in his career. We barely knew each other. But he said, um, I have this TV thing, and can you come down to a place called Siberia? And mm-hmm. it's in the depths of the subway on, I think, 48th or 49th or 50th, one of those streets. Mm-hmm. And I brought a whole bunch of sushi, and he filmed it. And it was like a tremendously weird, you know, it's like I wasn't close with him. He really didn't know me. But then when the program um, aired, it's like, well, I invite my friends over, and they bring food. And, you know, it was like, it was like I was, we were like buddies, you know, for, for years. But from that moment forward anytime uh, we would see each other or get together there was you know it was like you know he's picking up where you left off like we were we had become friends so um you know he he went from the ultimate outsider to much more of an insider i think that hurt him i i think i think that he he, he didn't want to be like that but how can you not want to be friends with Jose Andres and Eric Repair and everybody else? You know, I mean, so very conflicted. I uh, to this day I can't figure it out, but no one can. He's a good guy, though. My name's Hunter Lewis. I'm the chief fry cook of Food and Wine. I don't, I don't call him Tony because I don't, I didn't know him personally. But my my uh, one Bourdain encounter when I moved to New York City in '04, uh, you know, I'd been a line cook. I'd, actually, I was a prep cook back in North Carolina when a, a guy handed me Kitchen Confidential. This is back in 2001. And he said, you need to read this. Um, and he had all the mantra bravado of, of, you know, restaurant cooks that were celebrated in the book. And the book helped change my life because it, it gave me the permission to go and operate in a space in this sort of liminal zone between cooking and writing. Um, you know, not that I could I could write like Anthony could, but it, it gave me the permission to move to New York City and, and quit my my job as a newspaper reporter and, and to try to become a cook. And so, in a really ham-fisted way, um, I tried to tell Bourdain this. I saw him at a bar in the village, and I asked the bartender what he was drinking. He was drinking pills in Raquel. So I bought him one, and I had a little liquid courage myself, and I went up to him, and I gave him a beer. And he looked at me, and uh, he shooed me away with his hand. And, uh, <laughs> you know, at the time, I was like, you know what? I might have done the same thing. He had just uh, been come to fame with the book and just begun TV and, you know, was already tired of, of public adoration. Um, you know, but I think for me, I, I think about it. Uh, the other day, my five-year-old Smith was watching cartoons and I came back downstairs and um, she immediately turned the TV off like she was in trouble. I said, what were you watching? And she said, uh, I was watching your hero. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, the guy that travels all over the place. I don't know where he was, but that's your hero, right? And it really touched me because when I had kids, I watched, you know, and I, I was much more homebound than I am now, and I wasn't traveling, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, you know, going to places because we need to be home to take care of the kids. We watched Bourdain, you know, travel in our mind. You know, what that taught me was, you know, the, the value of curiosity and the value of, of empathy and the value of, of what you learn when you're on the road. And the fact that my kid had heard me say at one point, or heard somebody else say that, that he was a hero, that was cool. That's gorgeous. We got it. I didn't call him Tony till after he died. And I did consider him a friend. I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't tell after that. But you're the second person to say that Bourdain gave a connection with the kids. Uh, Gary said that too. Really? Yeah. You know, it's funny because they see him on TV. They like, they know he's cool. Yeah. They know he's original. You know, and that's a five-year-old. <laughs> that's yeah, that power. Yeah. My name is Gary Obligacion. I am the general manager of Post Ranch Inn in Big Sur, California. I, I, I've only met him once it was passing, so it's, it's more... Okay, I have two. <laughs> Everybody's got one. I have two. So um, 
The first was that um, Anthony came to San Francisco and uh, he, he was dining with a, he was gone to tour with a bunch of friends. He was friends with all my chef friends. So Chris Cosentino and uh, Lawrence Jossel and uh, Ravi Kapoor and really just this great group. They went out and they had sushi. And I heard stories of that night having sushi for years about how much they drank, how much they ate, how much fun they had. And it was just, that was Anthony. Uh, the second piece was that Anthony's TV shows, both of them, um, were a way for me to connect my industry to my own children. And my kids and I would watch the shows together. And, and we had this wonderful way of, of watching. So to a point, my son is now an adult. He's 22 years old. He was in Brooklyn when Anthony Bourdain passed away. Um, so when Anthony passed, he went out and he bought, I don't know where he even found it, but he found a CD of the Stooges. And he took it to Les Halles and placed it on the memorial. And he felt that that was the right memorial. And the fact that I had connected to my own child, to Anthony Bourdain, through the TV shows, that he felt a need to show respect, um, I thought was showed how absolutely pervasive he was and what a guide he was to, well, to all of us as humans. Patrick O'Connell, chef proprietor, the Inn at Little Washington in Washington, Virginia. Well, I think it's a terrific idea. Uh, Bourdain broke new ground for us uh, in the food industry and in the hospitality industry. He crossed over and went beyond the margins of what many of us were led to believe our roles were in today's culture. And I think that was a tremendous inspiration. And while doing it, while broke, break, breaking the mold, he was still able to be himself and be true to himself. So he's more than an inspiration for the culinary world. Um, he truly did what he did well enough that he was uncensored and totally authentic. And if we can all get there, uh, it'll be an amazing feat. Amy Mills, um, co-owner of 17th Street Barbecue. I think the best way that anyone in the hospitality industry can honor Anthony Bourdain and the legacy that he's left is to really look inside your own house, look inside your own kitchen, look inside the front of house and see who's struggling and who needs help and simply reach out a hand and offer to be there for someone and let them know this is a safe space they can come to you, um, they're not alone, that nobody is alone. I think we feel very isolated in our industry sometimes, and just knowing that one person cares may make all the difference to someone. Here is Laurie Woolever. <laughs> what is the thing that you want people, like a thought you want to put in people's head about Tony, that they might not know that hmm. some... Ah, uh, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, he shared so much of himself, uh, you know, in his writing and and on television. Uh, I I think that and, and you know he he people started to call him like the world's most interesting man or you know <laughs> like the, the Joe guy. yeah and, and he himself would say like I've got the best job in the world mm -hmm. and uh, you know my life is amazing. Um, I think you know I, I guess. And I, and I know that there was a sense of like, if this guy, like you said it, if if this guy with this life and this amazing story didn't find life worth living and, and a world worth sticking around in, like what is there for me? Um, so I guess I would just ask people to sort of think a little beyond that and just know that, you know, he was a gifted performer, you know, and, and a gifted storyteller and that... Um, you know, there, there, there were ways in which, uh, you know, that things were were not great, and and he was a human flawed human being, and he also was very transparent about his his struggles in some ways. You know, so just to kind of remember that that he was a that he was a full human being, and and that um, you know, just because you have a wildly successful television program and and uh, you know, ten million tw Twitter followers or whatever, you know, if 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 there's some some other thing that's fundamentally lacking, if there's a if there's a, a structure that's lacking there, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So, you, you know, it's it, 
I don't know. I'm not really. I'm not really think, summarizing this so eloquently, but um, you know, just that that he was that there was more. There was more to it than just the the surface glamour and 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 brilliance. Um, you know that that he was a flawed human being, like like anyone else. Thanks so much for listening and and, uh, sharing this time with us. Um, Again, I want to share those resources. Crisis Text Line, text 741-741-247-365. The Giving Kitchen, look for them online and in the notes here. And Ben's Friends, which is available in cities around the country should people need some solidarity for their recovery. I want to thank our producer, uh, Jen Martnick, and... uh, you can find past episodes at foodandwine.com on our YouTube page and just follow me on Twitter at Kitten with a Whip and I will guide you to anything you want to know. If you want to reach out and share your favorite memory of Tony, I'd be happy to hear it. Take care of yourself until the next time.